Peace, peace. How you guys doing today? Back with another video, back discussing a very important topic that comes up a lot in the community and with other people that I speak to, aspiring producers, aspiring artists, and just people that are curious in general about what I do and how I go about doing it when it comes to music. So the topic of today is, um, you know, vintage samplers going dollars and is it worth it? Uh, the answer to this question is very uh, involved, if you will. Uh, it's not that simple. And as many people might think, I'm not a very big uh, like purveyor or advocate for people to like just go buy a sampler because I don't think that it's uh, worth it for everybody. And I also don't think that this process or this way of creating music is going to be worth it for everybody. Uh, what do I mean by that? So the first thing uh, that, that I want to touch on when it comes to going, you know, not dollars, but working with vintage samplers like the ones that I have is the cost involved. Um, so if you guys saw my last video, my story time video on how I got my MPC 2000 XL, uh, for free, basically, uh, it was because somebody was getting rid of it. Somebody was throwing it out. My friend who's also a producer and now has a 2000 XL himself, um, brought me this to the studio and gave it to me as a gift. I had previously bought one myself on eBay and I ended up returning it because the screen had lines, which again is a common issue with MPC 2000 XL. These machines, both of those samplers that I have are no longer manufactured. So a lot of them now that they're reaching like the 30 or the 40 year mark of when they were manufactured um, are coming up for you know maintenance or they're giving problems already because electronics obviously after a certain time, no matter how well they were manufactured, are going to give issues. Um, a very cool thing is I saw recently, I, I never looked behind my ASR or like detailed look, but I've been like, you know, really getting into it. Um, this machine was, has a date on it that says 11 So I don't know who watches these videos, but that may be even before some of you guys were born. Um, so yeah, like a lot of these things are faulty. Um, I had to have I have had to do or have had people help me do maintenance on my 2000 XL uh, primarily. Um, the the Insonic has been pretty, pretty stable. Um, I, I had a situation where I had to change the key on it and I did it myself. But for the most part, the ASR um, has been pretty reliable. No maintenance yet. Um, there is a, a character on the display that's going out. Um, I don't know if that's something that is 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 something that I'm going to have to service soon or buy a part for it. Um, I, for example, on the on the Kai, I've had to change the pad sensors on it. And recently, um, I mentioned it in another video. <clears throat> excuse me. I had to have my cousin Ivan help me solder uh, two tack switches that were important to like how the machine functions because I was getting annoyed like this is not working. And that's just because um, tack switches, you know, for anybody that's an electrical engineer or into electronics, they have a click like lifespan. So if they're clicked like three million times after the three million and one time that tax switch is going to like work intermittently or not work at all. So that's one thing to consider is the cost and the price point of entry. If you want to go dollars or into the vintage world, you know, um, the way that it has happened for me has been kind of very organic, I will say. So it hasn't hit me all at once. And it's not something that I went in like, yeah, I'm going to do this all old school because that's how Kanye used to produce. Like, no, I saw that. I knew about that, that Kanye used the ASR. And it so happened to be that I I got the, the 2000 XL that I always wanted. And then later on, I was working a part time job at, at the Apple store here in New York on Fifth Ave for, for about a year. And um, I saved up. I saved up to buy this machine. I was reading the manual before I even got it. I was feeding basically. So I knew I wanted it. And and 
um, you know, I added it to my setup because I also was hitting a limitation with um, my MPC 2000 XL. And that's my next point. Um, you have to kind of start small, see where you're going with this, and then, you know, your process itself is going to call for you to, like, start adding the missing pieces, if you will. Because, you know, the thing about the internet and just, again, consumerism and marketing is that you're going to see things online, like people making a dope beat. You just think that if I get that box, I'm going to be able to make a fire beat. And that's not how this works at all. Um, most of these machines is like what you put in and what's going on in your creative mind is what you're going to get out of them. Do they facilitate that process or, you know, encourage you to be creative because of the way that they work? Yes, of course. But if you don't know where to start, you're not going to be able to get what you expect. And that's how, you know, like it happened with my 2000 XL. Some of these things end up in the trash bin on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace for dumb cheap because people get frustrated. Um, and you have to realize, like, where is your level of passion with this music production thing? And what are your ultimate goals? So, you know, to further, you know, kind of dive into the, the question of is this worth it? is you got to be honest with yourself. Like, are you a hobbyist? Are you an aspiring artist? Are you a producer that's trying to sell beats? Are you a producer that wants to travel and sell beats or work with other artists in other states? You know, and all these questions are going to kind of come up and you're going to be able to answer more truthfully whether, you know, this is just something that you think looks cool because you're using it or is it something that makes sense for your goals and for your aspirations as a as a musician in this industry or even as a hobbyist? Because what I would say is it's probably like more practical for a hobbyist that's into sampling and loves like boom bap or loves vintage equipment to get into it than a producer that's trying to be a professional in the industry. And I know that might sound kind of crazy or controversial, to, to a lot of you guys and a lot of people that talk about these machines, but it, it, I think it's very true because I do work in the industry. I, I work in major studios. I've worked with major artists. I've seen major producers and 90% of them don't use any of these machines. Um, in 2024 or 2023, when I, I was heavy in, in the studio last year, everybody has a laptop. And that's why I have my laptop, too, because I have to adapt. I have to adapt um, to the to the new era. Like, it's not practical for me to pack up an ASR as heavy as as hell. Uh, my MPC 2000 XL is lighter than the ASR, but it's also not portable by any means. And go make a beat with somebody in Colorado. Shout out to my boy, Devani, who's a producer and an artist over there. I say, yo, we're going to lock in. No, I take my, my laptop. You know, I did something crazy. I took my vocal chain uh, last time I went out to Colorado, but that's just because I was going over there to do vocals and I can't record without my vocal chain. Um, but yeah, like it doesn't make sense. Even if I go to the studio in the city, like I'm in Queens, if I go to the studio in the city, I'm not taking my ASR or even my 2000 XL. I'm taking my laptop, my hard drive, whatever beats are there. And, you know, I have Ableton that I, that I bought, Ableton Live Suite, and I do have FL Studio um, Producer Edition that I bought, too, a few years back. So I'm ready for, like, creating on the spot just with within a DAW as well. And that's where I would start, right? So, like, for to, to you know, to go back to the beginning of, of where I started, like, people that asked me, hey, Free, I'm trying to get into production. Like, what do you recommend? You know, even if you like making boom bap. So I like to ask people, like, what genre of music you make? Whatever. Like, if you like making boom bap, I would say get Ableton. Get, get Ableton. They got a great sampler in there that's very powerful. I mean, even the sampler in Ableton, if you know... About the ASR, a lot of it is modeled after the ASR 10 to, you know, if you know, you know. Um, and if you want to make trap style music with crazy 808s and, you know, do crazy hi-hat rolls and stuff like that, get FL Studio. 
You know, if you're uh, recording a lot of live instruments like guitars and you want a crazy, you know, like sample library already, you know, mess with Logic. If you like GarageBand or you got an iPad or you're in the Mac OS system, you know, mess around with Logic. Um, and that's that's kind of where I would start. Right. Like all of these things have a like a trial, you know, period that you could start. And you could see if you're really, really passionate about this. And I test myself with that, too. Like, I go in and I'm like, damn, should I buy Ableton $750? I'm like, let me start with the intro. And then I'm like, damn, I'm using this every day. I'm researching this every day. I wake up and I'm thinking about this. I'm doing this all the time. So I'm like, all right, let me get the next version and the next version until eventually I got sweet, which was expensive, right? Um, so the cost of entry for, for being a producer, it's more accessible now than it was back in the day. Like I looked up the ASR when it dropped was worth $2,800. It wasn't cheap to be a producer back in the day. And that's why like, you know, whoever used to help a producer get into it or however they figured it out, you had to be real serious about wanting to do this before you got into it. But nowadays everybody has a laptop, you know, FL starts at like 99, I think. And, you know, Logic Pro, which is a very, very powerful DAW, is like 200 bucks. At least that's what it used to be um, when I was working at Apple. It's like, that's that's cheap. You got 200 you probably bought sneakers that are worth $200. So if you're really serious, I will start there. And that's where I start people that I'm, like, thinking about mentoring because I don't really take on too many people as, as a mentor because... I'm super passionate and dedicated. Like, this is all I do. I wake up and I'm thinking about music. I'm doing music. I'm researching music. It's it's a very sick obsession for me. So I like to see somebody that's at that level or higher at, when it comes to being thirsty about music for me to take them, like, under my wing after, you know, doing this for over, for more than a decade already. I was thinking about it. So it's like, if you're not dedicated to, like, your computer, which you have access to, and you could sample off of YouTube and do all sorts of crazy things with the drums and get your musical ideas out, basically, which is what we're trying to do at the end of the day, then why are you going to go buy an MPC that is vintage? You're definitely going to have to put in money to fix it, and you're definitely going to have to put in a lot of time, and that's time is money, to learn it, because these things are slow. These things are slow. And that's one of it. That's an advantage to me now because it's a, a tool that I use to be, you know, creative. And I, I'm already like pretty I convinced myself that I'm I'm in it. I'm in it for the long run with this, you know, after a decade of like obsession, obsession, you know, quitting jobs and just doing this full time going in. I interned for two years for free at a studio just to learn like you got to be passionate and then obviously you earn your keep, right? Like you earn like, all right, yeah, I, I am going to work on this all the time. I am going to read the manual. I am going to put in time to get nice at it. My beats sound whack on this. I can make a beat sound better. When I started, I can make a beat sound better in Ableton than I could on my 2000 XL. And I'm like, that for a minute, it made me go back to Ableton. And I'm just like, you know, forget this. It's too hard to like chop a loop and make it sound good on on the two like how how was Kanye or anybody working on this thing like but again that's like part of the what makes you respect the process and realize like damn I gotta put in time for this to sound good and I like putting in that time you know so um I would say like you know pretty much my point is like what's your what's your level of dedication and what are your goals? Like, if you want to be a producer that, that wants to get placements and you want to sell beats online or even in person to other artists, just use your laptop. Or, you know, if you don't have a laptop, invest in a good gaming laptop if you like Windows or a Mac, if you like the Mac OS ecosystem. And just lock in and start making beats. When you sell beats, I'm telling you right now, I don't care if it's a boom bap artist if it's a, a, a new artist or whatever, new age, I don't know what they're calling it now, drill, trap, or uh, whatever. Um, they don't care where you made your beats on. They just want that shit to sound dope and you get a, get a placement, you know what I mean? So you just got to lock in and be as productive as possible at that point. Um, and there's way more tutorials on how to make beats on these dolls than 
on the samplers. You know, hopefully now we'll be able to show more of the process. I start to see that the community is big and is getting bigger, you know, and that's great because when I started off, there was only the NPC forum and, you know, gear space um, to learn like on forums. You got to read and then take what you read and try to visualize that and go back and sit down in front of your samplers. It wasn't no shiny videos like showing you how to make a beat on the NPC. So, you know, we're lucky that we have that as a resource, but then also take into account that there is there really isn't a dollless setup. So even people that say they work dollless, you know, I was watching a very prominent YouTuber that I, I follow what he talks about, you know, as far as like, you know, when they when they put out videos, I support it. But then he was saying, oh, I record everything into Ableton as a two track. Like a, I use it as a tape deck. All right. But you're still using a doll. Even if you're recording your your beat at the end into Ableton, you got to know how to use Ableton. So you got to learn a doll. You can't escape it. If you want to sell beats to artists, more likely than not, if they're going to a, a commercial recording studio, they're recording vocals in Pro Tools or any DAW. We're in the digital era. It's 2024. So no one's recording a two-inch tape anymore. And that's a fact. So you're going to have to learn a DAW anyway. You're going to have to invest in something to record your beats that you make on this anyway. So why not start with the thing that you're going to need, right? Like at the end of your process, start at the end. You know, I think that's a quote from like some philosophy guy. Start at the end, you know, like start with your dog. See how dedicated you are. Be like, damn, all right. I already exhausted like everything I could learn on Ableton or FL or whatever, Studio One. All right, let me get an MPC. Maybe you start with one of the newer MPCs. I don't personally like go there because I already have one. So I don't like to buy things just because there's a new, oh, this is faster. No, I already have, my MPC could do everything the new ones can. It takes longer, yeah. Do I care? No, because my creative process is to slow down nowadays, you know, like meditate, zen out. I like that. I like to lock in. So, um, and what I mean by locking in is like, I like to like lose track of time and just like, even if it takes longer, I'm like, you know, in my machine, I don't need something to get chopped super quick. But again, like if you're starting off 400 bucks, NPC one Craigslist, Facebook marketplace, reverb. All right. I like this being outside of the doll. I don't really see myself missing my reverb plugins from Ableton or whatever. All right. Now you want to go slower or vintage. How much bread do you have? Because even if you find a $400 MPC 2000 XL or a 2000, it's not going to be in great condition. So now you got to buy pad sensors. Go on mpcstuff.com and, and that's where most people get their parts. See how much some of these parts cost or go on eBay or Reverb. This is not cheap, you know, and then labor. Do you know how to solder? Are you going to find somebody that knows how to solder? Are you going to go in there yourself and potentially mess it up? and have to buy a whole new machine. So these are some of the things you have to consider before you go out and buy a sampler. You know, maybe you get a new SP404 because that's similar to a 2000 XL, to be honest, or the KO, you know, the, the Teenage Engineering is like a mini 2000 XL. It's only 300 bucks. Yeah, you know, these things, whatever, they got some controversy around what, how durable, reliable. But I would just say like, you have to use this to like measure your level of passion and dedication before you go out and just say, yeah, I'm going to get an ASR and an and a, and a, and a MPC 2000 XL and I'm going to be making beats like Yay or Pharrell. Like, no, those beats come out like that because that's how they think. That's how they sound. Everybody's going to sound like themselves at the end of the day. Your creative choices, your sound selection and how you think about music is going to basically direct what product is that comes out. So none of these things are going to make you sound like anybody but yourself. So, you know, I, I want to close this out because I think I covered most of the, the, the reasons why you should or shouldn't. You know, I'm not going to make a list. I'm just kind of like doing these videos be, in between the other videos I'm working on. I want to put out these story time type of videos where I kind of just talk to you guys like, like you my boy that's trying to get into music or 
you're my friend that's asking for my honest opinion. So I'm not going to edit this. You know, I know I might have stumbled upon some words or whatever. But, you know, really be honest with yourself about your level of commitment to this and if it's worth it. Because when you add up the cost of repairs, how much these things cost, again, I'm not going to say what I paid, but, you know, I got this for free, obviously, but it's not cheap. Like, it's thousands of thousands of dollars. Even Ableton Live Suite was like 750 I think I said that already, but... The laptops ain't cheap. The computers ain't cheap. And and that's not, again, we're not showing off like how, who got the most bread or the most expensive stuff. It's basically like, you know, start start low so that you could know whether this is going to be a, a worthwhile investment. And then the final thing, yeah, I was thinking about that before. The final thing too is space. Like these things take up a lot of space for you to set up. And the portability factor, I already talked about that. But there's been times that I have I haven't been able to work on them because I just don't got the space to like put up the whole setup, you know. And ideally, like for me, where I'm at now as a, a artist, I'm not really like trying to get as much beats done a day or get placements or you know like rush my process. You know, another commenter and I mentioned this in another video that I'm gonna put out. They were saying, like, why do you do the tracking like that? Why do you? Because I, for my art, like, this is what I've committed to, and this is how I like to work. So it's a very intentional choice for me to slow down and to be <laughs> using floppies. Like, like I was showing Shorty, you know, like, this. she's like, well, you got what the fuck? Like, that shit takes so long to load a kick. Like, I have a bunch of kicks that it, it, it's like three discs <laughs> to load them up across the whole keyboard. And I like the sound of the flop. I grew up like, you know, with floppy was my first computer experience um, when I was a kid. So it's like nostalgia for me. Like, I got into film because it's nostalgic for me to, like, you know, use film and the, even the smell of film. It's crazy. But, you know, all these things, like, have a meaning for me, you know. That might not be for you. Like, if you're a younger dude, you'd be like, what the hell is a floppy disk? Why well, I got to go buy a floppy? You know, you could just save it on your hard drive. But that might make more sense for you. You know, so don't just do things because you see other people doing it and think you're going to get the same results. So I leave you guys with that, man. Um, if there's something I missed, y'all want to get in the comments and, you know, tell me I'm wrong or tell me I'm right. You know, feel free. Again, I'm, I'm just here to, to speak from the heart and tell you guys what my honest opinion is about um, about all of this. Um, thank y'all for rocking with me. Again, it's your boy Free Play, and I'll see y'all next time.